This video is brought to you by NVIDIA's RTX GPUs, powering technological leaps like DLSS 3, giving you more frames than ever before in games like Cyberpunk 2077, Alan Wake 2, and even the finals. Click the link below to check it out for yourself or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Let me put it this way. It's been a long time since something has come along in the shooter space that's felt this fresh and this full of promise. Rainbow Six Siege was one of those moments back in 2015, just an incredible new spin on the tactical multiplayer shooter genre that forced you to think about environments and destructibility as no game before it had. Tarkov birthed the extraction shooter genre in 2016, a genre that still, nearly a decade later, is waiting for its moment in the mainstream sun, with various studios including Bungie working to make that happen. That same year, Blizzard would take the hero shooter genre to new heights with Overwatch, though they didn't really know where to take it after that and that's how we ended up with Overwatch 2. PUBG kicked off the entire Battle Royale revolution in 2017, and later that year Fortnite would pivot away from being a PvE co-op tower defense game and toward a full-scale Battle Royale. Video games have never been the same since. Apex Legends would be the next major foray into the Battle Royale genre, launching in 2019 and immediately becoming a gigantic success for Respawn and EA, its excellent setting, characters, gunplay and flexible ping system all feeling like a genuine step forward in the Battle Royale genre. In June 2020, Riot launched Valorant, which was kind of like a hero shooter meets Counter-Strike, and it's gone on to find a massive audience in its own right, and Hunt Showdown arrived that same year, delivering a setting and soundscape that to this day no game has been able to match. But that was like three years ago, right? It's been a minute since anything's come along in this space that's really made people sit up and pay attention. And with that backdrop, along comes the finals, which right now, at the time of writing, is the sixth most played game on Steam, outpacing Call of Duty, Apex Legends, Team Fortress, and every single other shooter except for PUBG and Counter-Strike. So, what's the deal, man? What's what's going on here? Is this just because people have nothing else to play right now? Or is this game the real deal? Is this just flash and pan hype? Or has this game got the legs to go the distance? Look, on that second question, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know, because no one can really predict how these things go in the long term. I remember when Splitgate blew up after years of no one paying attention to it, and then it very quickly dropped off again after that. I remember all of us being super happy with how Halo Infinite launched, but then 343 really dropped the ball. I remember when Battlefield 2042 shat the bed right through to the ensemble, and now it's coming back with some great improvements resulting in respectable player base numbers. You just don't know how it's going to go with this stuff, but I will say this. The Finals is a fantastic video game, and if it somehow doesn't go the distance, it won't be because the core gameplay loop, gunplay, level design or setting failed to deliver. Not since Apex Legends have I been so immediately impressed by the quality of a newly released shooter. From game modes to traversal to weapon mechanics to netcode, The Finals feels like year three in your average live service, like Embark have already gone through the painful two years of half-baked gameplay and bugs and apology JPEGs and cratering play accounts. The Finals feels finished in an era where most of these sorts of games launch anything but finished. But it's not the polish that defines the finals, it's how genuinely fresh it feels. It harkens back to the more arena style shooter that's so much less popular these days compared to tactical shooters or battle royales. It favours high time to kill in an era when low time to kill is definitely king. Its visual identity is wholly unique, there's no other game that looks quite like this except for Mirror's Edge, and there are reasons for that of course, we will come back to them. More than anything else though, this this level destruction is the single best implementation of destructible environments in any video game maybe? You are able to completely level entire buildings either for kicks or for deeply strategic reasons. The way this plays and looks and feels is incredible and the way it deepens the strategic possibilities in the gameplay loop is like nothing else. Having said all of that, the finals is still at the beginning of what is hopefully going to be a very long journey for Embark and the game still has plenty of teething issues. Balance is the biggest one. To be honest, it's kind of balked across different classes, gadgets and weapons. Game modes could definitely do with some tweaking, particularly with regards to incentives. There also feels like there could be some more game modes that are able to make use of the destruction model in more interesting ways. Given how important teamwork is, matchmaking tools and social systems could definitely be improved. And finally, there are widespread reports of hacking on PC, and that's definitely caused a lot of frustration and disappointment within the Steam community. But even with these sorts of shortcomings and issues, the finals feels like we're witnessing another one of those moments in the shooter genre, like the ones I listed earlier. A game that comes along and you just immediately know that something has shifted, and it cannot shift back. 
The first time you bring an entire building down on someone's head, you just know that something is going on here. I certainly felt that when I first played this, and that feeling has not gone away some 40 hours later. To understand what the finals is, you first need to understand who made it. Meet Embark Studios, founded in November 2018. It's based in Sweden and it's led by a number of former DICE employees, the studio behind both the Battlefield franchise and Mirror's Edge. I told you we'd come back to that one. Embark said that when they formed, they prototyped a whole bunch of ideas for what they wanted to make first, and the first thing they decided on was this, Ark Raiders. It had a fantastic debut trailer that made it look like a lo-fi sci-fi spin on the Destiny formula. Sadly, that game has transformed considerably since its debut, with Embark announcing some time ago that it's now a PvP extraction shooter, a genre that's fairly divisive in a love it or hate it sense. Regardless, Embark were always planning on shipping Ark Raiders first, but while they were working on that, they were also prototyping other ideas. Unsurprisingly, the people who helped make Battlefield and Mirror's Edge kind of came up with a game that combined the class design, gunplay, and level destruction of Battlefield with the futurist urban setting and aesthetic of Mirror's Edge. Embark claimed that when that prototype was stood up internally, it was so fun to play that they immediately redirected their efforts toward it, putting Ark Raiders on the backburn so they could pile all of their resources into this new project and get it out the door first. That project was, of course, the finals, and if the initial success of the game is anything to go by, Embark certainly made the right call. So what is the finals? Well, it's an exclusively PvP game, there are no PvE game modes, it's a 3v3v3 team shooter with two main game modes. The first is centered on collecting bank vaults, taking them to a spot and protecting the vaults while they cash out. The second is a more free-for-all style mode where you collect coins from around the map and by killing opponents, and you bank them instantaneously in an ATM Thing. There's no defending a position there, so it's a lot more running around the map. But certainly the finals is centered on that more strategic cash out mode, and that's the most active playlist. There's also a tournament variation on it, which has limited respawns and a tournament style elimination structure. Finally, there's a ranked mode, which is exactly that, ranked. It is a free-to-play game available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. There's no pay to win here. You can buy cosmetics from the cash shop, as well as a battle pass that gives you even more cosmetics. But anything gameplay related, like weapons or gadgets, are unlocked via playing the game, and there's no way to speed up unlocks by playing. In this way, Embark are operating a fair monetization model. I've certainly seen far worse. One question you might have off the top is, do you need a team in order to play this game? Okay, so I put about 40 hours into this game at this point, around 20 hours during various pre-release betas and 20 hours post-launch. The first 20 hours I played, I was always playing with a team, and the second 20 hours, I was always solo. The question about whether or not you can play this solo really depends on what you want to achieve when playing. If you want to play competitively, play the tournament mode, play ranked mode, then absolutely you will need a properly coordinated team on party chat, shot calling, sweating their balls off. This is a mechanically demanding and strategic game where class composition is important and teamwork is vital if you care about winning. Personally, I don't give a fuck about winning because I just find the moment to moment gameplay super fun such that even if I'm on a massive losing streak and my teammates suck and half of them are quitting the match when they lose the first cash out, I am still having a good time. There's enough arena shooter DNA in this that you don't always need to play it as a team-based tactical shooter all the time. You can pick the heavy class, you can soak up some big damage, smash through some walls, take down one or two fools, and then die happy, ready to respawn and do it all over again a few seconds later. So for me, I've been playing the quick match cash out mode almost exclusively since launch. I've been playing solo and I've been loving it. But like I said, if you care about winning, then yes, you will absolutely need a squad to run with. Obviously, it being a free-to-play game helps when it comes to roping in some of your mates. Having said that, it's pretty clear that Embark could be doing a lot more to help facilitate good team compositions and teamwork. Matchmaking, for example. You do pre-select one of the three class types before queuing, but it's very common to get matched with two other people who all chose the same class. You also can't see by default what their loadout is. You have to press a button to bring that up, and sometimes because of the way that the loading sequence works, you don't even get the time to do that. When you are in a game, there is a contextual ping system that you can use to highlight destinations and enemies, but it's very basic, and many other 
other games have far more sophisticated and flexible dynamic ping systems that better facilitate teamwork without you having to be in voice chat. That stuff can come later, however, and I'm sure it will, but right now it feels very difficult to properly coordinate with matchmade teammates, and that creates quite a disadvantage for you if you ever happen to matchmake against pre-stacked teams. Finals is not a hero shooter, it is instead, much like Battlefield, a class-based shooter where you can have a lot of control over how to customize your classes. There are three classes, light, medium and heavy. Each class has both a set of core gadgets unique to them, as well as a range of weapons and secondary gadgets that can either be unique to them or shared with other classes. The light class is exactly what you'd expect, a smaller hitbox, they move much faster, their core gadgets are focused on movement and invisibility, they use light weapons like silent pistols, throwing knives or swords. They're about either outrunning an opponent, duking them, or stealth guerrilla style gameplay. They are particularly devastating when they run around with their shotgun and invis combo, able to absolutely ether pretty much any target instantly before slipping back into stealth straight after. The medium class is, in effect, a support class. Its core gadgets are things like a healing beam, a defensive turret, or a recon thing that allows you to highlight targets through walls. It's a strong fill position, and if you play it well, you can absolutely help crush your team to victory. The heavy is... a lot. It has the highest health pool by far. It has the ability to literally run through walls, collapsing buildings as it does so. It has a shield ability, which can soak up a huge amount of damage, as well as a deployable barricade. It has an RPG on a really short cooldown, as well as C4, which can be strapped to throwable exploding objects for even more blast radius and damage. It has some very high damage, high ammo count LMG weapons, as well as a flamethrower, which absolutely melts people and a sledgehammer that will basically one-hit a light class if they manage to get close enough to do it. So, as you can probably tell from the way I've described these classes, there are some balance issues here. To be honest though, that's totally to be expected for a new game like this. Embark ran plenty of internal tests and closed betas, and I've seen for myself how certain stuff has been either nerfed or buffed over time, but that was all based on a few thousand people playing. Now there are millions of people playing, finding out all sorts of crazy meta shit and breaking the game in unexpected ways. It's perfectly natural for there to be minor and major balance issues, and Embark will surely address them. I will say though, that nothing here stands out as utterly game-breaking. I think we've all played games where a particular class or item is just totally broken right off the jump and it takes a developer days, weeks or months to fix it, the finals is absent anything like that. Embark tested this game well, there are some issues for sure, but they're all inside the margin of error for this sort of rollout and it will no doubt get better over time. Bringing things up a level, I really think Embark should be congratulated on how distinct these classes feel and how viable so many of the weapons and gadgets are. It's not like there's a clear best team composition or a single best loadout for a given class. Sure, some are stronger than others, but a good 70 to 80% of the weapons and gadgets at your disposal are truly viable. If you want your heavy to focus on destruction, then you can choose like four things to make that happen. Similarly, if you want to focus on suppressive fire, barricades and shields, that works extremely well. You can also just be a filthy brawler, bum-rushing foes with a flashbang and a sledgehammer, and that absolutely works almost every time. I think it's impossible to get this stuff right the first go around, and seeing how well all of this functions, you are reminded of the fact that at least some of the people who made this spent the better part of their careers making Battlefield games. These gadgets and weapons feel very analogous to what we see in a Battlefield game, and so I think the functionality, effectiveness, and balance of each of these things works as well as they do, because the people who made them have made them many times before while working at DICE. I think that's most evident when it comes to gunplay and weapon mechanics. As soon as you fire your first AK or Lewis gun here in the finals, you're like, oh yeah, these people definitely made Battlefield games. There's a very familiar pattern of recoil, muzzle flash, aim down sight speed, handling, sound design, and all of it sings with the same expert craftsmanship that the rest of the game does. No matter which weapon you pick up, it feels brilliant to use, familiar and reliable, though somewhat novel given the setting. The choice of weapons here in the finals is one of its more surprising aspects. The weapons are very classic weapons, AKs and SCAR assault rifles, M60 LMGs, Uzis, sword off shotguns. Compare this weapon lineup to the laser shields that the heavies are able to deploy, or the magic healing beams that the mediums can use, or the deployable high-tech turrets. There's also the fact that the finals is actually a VR spectator sport, hence the crowds cheering, the game show pre-roll, and the boisterous commentators. Given that this is clearly a futurist setting, why didn't we get a more futuristic suite of weapons? Where's the assault rifle that fires lasers, or the auto-tracking pistol, or the railgun? I don't know man, but to be honest with you, 
I like this weird mishmash of the old and new. The finals has all the stylized trappings of something set in the near or distant future, to the point where it can feel a little cold and sterile at times. So there's something really comforting about picking up an old Lewis gun and knowing that it still gets the job done a few hundred years after it was invented. Stepping into the game for the first time, this arsenal is one less barrier to entry because you're already so familiar with these types of weapons that you can just get straight to work with them. Finally, and I think most importantly, these are the weapons that this team knows how to make really well. I like that they leaned into their strengths and went with that. It's produced exceptional gunplay right off the bat, so I think that Embark going with the weapons that they're used to making was a very good call. One thing to note though is that the gunplay model combined with the high time to kill won't be for everyone. These weapons are very high recoil, far more so than many other popular shooters you're probably playing right now. It's the sort of recoil you'd expect to find in more tactical shooters like Siege or Counter-Strike. The thing is though, those games have very low time to kill, whereas here it's deliberately very high. And that regularly results in you emptying your magazine into or near a target and then managing to escape with just the tiniest sliver of health. It happens all the day time, perhaps more so than any game I've played in a long time at least. It is controversial within the emerging finals community. Some people find the balance too frustrating, while others are perfectly fine with it, saying that it's all about learning how to use your weapon better, aka get good. I probably fall somewhere in between. I do think that some weapons have just a little too much kick, some classes have just a little too much HP. I think there are some minor changes needed to dial this in, but it's not a massive problem. It's similar to what I said earlier about overall game balance. Embark have a little bit of work to do here, but not a lot. And more than anything else, I appreciate the high time to kill because it does make me focus on mastering my weapon, only taking the shots I know I'll hit and prioritizing targets when the situation calls for it. So the finals is getting a lot of attention for its level destruction, and for good reason. But before that, I really want to talk about the level design and traversal, because as impressive as it is to blow up these levels, I really believe that their layouts combined with the various movement techs are the secret source that make this game as good as it is. So obviously, the Mirror's Edge inspiration is pretty clear here in the finals. You look at its shiny surfaces, its white face buildings, its glass panels, its cold steel, the hint of futurism without taking things too far into the future. The color and vibrancy of it is perhaps the biggest touch point. No matter which level you're on, every frame just pops and the game constantly looks incredible. It's also extremely readable. The visual design isn't just for aesthetic sake, it's sheer and it's decluttered to the point where you can see really clearly exactly what's going on all the time. I play a lot of shooters and visual clarity is a problem in many of them. Ironically enough, Battlefield 2042 was diabolical in this regard. Always difficult to see what was happening, tell friend from foe. That never happens here in the finals. No matter how crazy shit gets, I can always see exactly what's going on. But the comparisons to Mirror's Edge aren't just about the aesthetics. There's also a lot of the traversal DNA carried through here as well. Now to be clear, there's no parkour in a strict sense, no vaulting, no wall running or whatever, but there is a big focus on movement tech that lets you get to where you want to get to really fast. Jump pads, zip lines, grapple hooks, you can mantle up ledges really quickly. The game will almost always give you a zip line straight up rather than a ladder because it wants to keep you moving. Embark want to maintain your momentum, and as you run across rooftops toward the next vault or cash out zone, you will feel the same sort of rush you felt when you were nailing your parkour routines when playing Mirror's Edge. That feeling is only possible because of how well designed these levels are. This is a very vertical game, and many of the spaces are quite sectioned off from one another. There are built Buildings where you enter in on the ground floor, but you need to get up to the top floor really quickly. Generally speaking though, no matter where you spawn from or where you need to get to, there's almost always going to be a very smooth path toward it. You can tell that Embark have spent a lot of time in each of these levels looking at the routes, the choke points, the spawn points, the cash out zones. They really put in the work to make sure that you almost never feel frustrated at the level layout. Like you want to get somewhere quickly, but there isn't a path to do so. So instead you have to take the long way around while you know the clock is ticking. It's seamless and invisible. You won't notice this until you notice it, but when you do, you'll definitely be like, good job Embark. 
The other thing that spices up the levels are the throwables that Embark have left laying around. Exploding canisters, poison gas drums, little pink boxes full of goo. You can immediately pick this stuff up as you're running towards an objective, or you can shoot it out of the sky as every level has these balloons that are full of this stuff just hanging there. Most of the time, these throwables produce rather unexpected results because throwing them at precise locations is tricky. They bounce and roll a lot when they land. So they naturally introduce an element of chaos that's awesome. And you throw something out, you see what happens, and then you roll with the punches after that. But yeah, by far and away the most impressive aspect of the finals is the level destruction. Chances are that if you can see it, you can destroy it. It feels like such a fresh take because right now, it is. Only Battlefield was doing level destruction in a way that truly meant something, and Battlefield 2042 really dropped the ball on this with some truly abysmal level destruction that was a massive step back versus previous entries. So here's DICE 2.0 showing them how it's done. And yeah, I mean, it never gets old. It never stops being extremely fucking cool to collapse an entire building. You will feel like you're playing 5D chess when you shoot the cash out vault from underneath, dropping it down a few floors to rest in your lap. You can also just bring a building down on top of a cash out point to make it both harder to reach and easier to defend. And that's why this matters so much. This is not some gimmick for gameplay trailers sake. Level destruction is baked into the very core gameplay loop of the finals. And how many games from the past two decades can you say that of? Fortnite maybe? Sure, but I'd argue that building was more important than destruction in Fortnite. And to be clear, this level destruction isn't just a design choice that Embark flipped a switch on, it's new technology. I spoke to them about it when I first previewed the game, and they informed me that what they've done here is only possible because they've developed a new server-based model for environment destruction, where previously in games like Battlefield it was very client-led, meaning that it caused all sorts of sync issues for players. Here, when destruction happens, everyone sees exactly the same thing at the same time, and that's allowed Embark to essentially build their game around it in a way that wasn't possible earlier. What Embark have done here with level destruction feels so good and so fresh, to the point where you start to imagine what other games could do with this sort of technology. Like imagine if Halo or Destiny had a game mode that functioned like this. Imagine what you could do with that. Think of how much this sort of destruction could breathe life into Call of Duty, both its standard multiplayer and its Warzone mode. This is what I meant earlier about a shift that we can't go back from. Now we know that level destruction can be like this and can have this much impact on gameplay. It's gonna be very, very hard to go back. Only one contestant left for the ultra rares. They need to avoid a team wipe. The high notes are all off the scale. Just one contestant left. One of the most controversial aspects of the finals is its announcers, and not because they're annoying, which they are, and not because of their terrible jokes, because they are terrible, but rather because the announcers are a mix of recorded actors and AI-assisted text-to-speech. Our contestants aren't here to play nice, as evidenced by that first elimination. This is what it's all about, partner. The powerhouses will need to come back from that wipeout. They've gone for a power nap now, Scotty. So to be clear, these announcers are not AI voices. They are real people that Embark worked with to record a bunch of stuff. After that though, they used AI assisted text to speech tools to create more dialogue. That's why some of the lines can sound a little weird and stilted sometimes. To be honest, it's hard to notice. And had I not heard about all this stuff before, I probably wouldn't have noticed that these are in part automated. The problem is less so the quality of the announcer dialogue, but rather the ethics of utilizing AI-assisted technology to generate voice lines, rather than paying voice talent to record all of those additional lines. Now, I actually reached out to Embark about this to get their response to what was a pretty heated debate on the matter on Twitter. Here's what they sent me, quote, We use a combination of recorded voice audio and audio generated via text-to-speech tools in our games, depending on the context. Sometimes recording real scenes where actors get together, allowing character chemistry and conflict to shape the outcome, is something that adds depth to our game worlds that technology can't emulate. Other times, especially when it relates to contextual in-game callouts, text-to-speech allows us to have tailored voiceover where we otherwise wouldn't, e.g. due to speed of implementation, end quote. They'd go on to clarify this, quote, making games without actors isn't an end goal for Embark, and text-to-speech technology has introduced new ways for us to work together, end quote. Okay, so this is actually really complicated to unpack. On the one hand, they've hired actual people. They've paid them and they've got their consent to use their voice with 
this text-to-speech tool. So what's the problem, you ask? Well, it's a real thin end of the wedge situation. It starts with this, but eventually studios will only need to pay voice actors for a fraction of the total amount of lines that end up in a game because they're relying on AI and text-to-speech to generate the bulk of the lines based on just a few initial recording sessions. Eventually, the only voice talent who'll be able to get work are the ones willing to sign over indefinite and unlimited usage rights to their voice in a given project. And given that it's a buyer's market in the voiceover industry, that's absolutely the way it'll go. There's also the other argument, which at face value makes a lot of sense. The one that says that AI assisting tools and text to speech allow for faster implementation of new voice lines, whereas recording new lines with actual voice actors is slow. Well, that's just not true. Gianni Matrigiano is a voice actor who kind of kicked off this discourse on Twitter when they highlighted Embark's announcers sounding suspiciously AI-like. They personally rebutted Embark's claims that voice work can take months. Quote, We are constantly banging out rush order sessions for like within a day or two. You can literally get pro-grade VO for less than a grand total, bang out a couple of recording sessions and bam, you have all the audio you need. End quote. Furthermore, I can personally attest to this as I've ordered stuff from professional voice actors in the past, and since they often have makeshift at-home studios, they were able to turn it around in hours, not months, and that's just me sourcing it cold, whereas Embark are a proper funded studio full of veteran developers with a vast network of contacts they'd be able to tap into. The final dimension to all of this is that the announcers in the finals just kind of suck. Like they spam out these really generic puns that don't add anything. All of it feels totally canned and you absolutely could have pre-recorded every single one of these lines and the game would have been better for it because humans might have been able to do something with these lines that the text to speech machine couldn't. Here, Embark have used this technology that you'd assume should elevate how dynamic the shock calling and color commentary is, but instead it just has the opposite impact, making this already very generic commentary track feel even more lifeless and robotic. So to finish, let's put all this in context. 99% of people who play this game will not even notice that there's some sort of weird stuff going on here with the announcers. Of that remaining 1%, 99% of those probably won't care about the fact that the voice lines are AI assisted. None of this changes the fact that the finals is a fantastic video game. But if you're like me, that 0.01% of people who do care about this, then this stuff sort of takes the luster off a title that in every other aspect is incredible. I guess another way to put it is that the finals feels like a beachhead in a war that we know is coming and that creatives will probably lose. And as a result, they become something melancholic about celebrating its success too widely or too loudly. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about is less about the finals and more just kind of a general point. So the finals has a battle pass. It's like 10 bucks, but you can also buy a premium version that skips a bunch of tiers. I've put about 20 hours into the game and I am not very far into this battle pass. To be fair, I hear you progress much faster in the tournament and ranked mode, but that's a lot more sweaty and I play solo, so that's not for me. So I'm looking at that battle pass and I'm thinking, damn man, it's gonna take me a long ass time to unlock all of that shit. Part of that is by design, of course, with publishers banking on the idea that if you fall short at the end of a season, you'll have to buy a few ranks to get the stuff you want. Part of it is also about establishing habits, forcing you to log in that little bit more than you otherwise might, so you don't fall behind on the battle pass. Here's the thing though, Right now, I'm taking a break from Destiny, and that means I'm moonlighting between a number of different live service games. I've played a lot of Diablo 4 this season, I've started playing Fortnite, LaMeo, please bully me, I deserve it. I've been playing Marvel Snap for over a year, I'm now playing the finals. For each of those games I just listed, I bought the Battle Pass, and I was happy to do so, because three out of four of those games are free to play, and I have no problem supporting the work of developers. They give me a game to play, I feel obliged to sling them a few bucks, no problem. But right now, I'm looking at four very incomplete battle passes because I don't have time enough to finish the battle passes for all four of those games. And so next season, I won't buy all four. I'll buy one, maybe, because otherwise I'll feel like I'm just wasting my money. So what's my point with all this? My point is that right now, every fucking game has a battle pass and all of them are tuned under the assumption that you will play 60 or 70 or 80 or 100 hours to unlock all of the things. 
And we can only do that if we commit to that one game, forsaking all others. I would love it if publishers would just let us get through these battle passes faster because, like I said, I'm happy to pay for a season of new shit. And if I could unlock all of that stuff inside of like 25 to 30 hours, it'd be like happy days. I'm gonna feel really good about that purchase and I'm gonna come back next season and buy it again. But right now I've got like four excellent games that I played this season and four incomplete battle passes that fill me with a tinge of regret feeling like I was a bit silly with my money. So publishers, if you listen to this, you guys have to figure this out because if every game is gonna have a battle pass, then you can't all tune the requirements as though no other games exist. That's just, that's just not gonna work. Anyway, that was a random tangent. Apologies for that, but I feel like I just needed to get it off my chest. To conclude with relation to the finals, I will reiterate what I said at the start. The finals, it rules. I really do love this. From the first moment I picked it up, I loved it, and I only love it more now after having dumped a bunch of hours into it. It is gorgeous, it has incredible style, the gunplay is top tier, the level design is excellent, the level destruction creates a new paradigm that other games are sure to adopt, and bottom line, it's just a really, really fun game. You just load in and win or lose, you're gonna have a great time. It is so rare to see new games like this launch this polished, but rarer still to see something so full of vibrancy and energy and ideas. This is certified fresh, no doubt about it, and I recommend it to you. All right, so that's the review done. Now let's do a bit of a deep dive into some of the tech that powers this game's visuals thanks to this video's sponsor, NVIDIA. So The Finals is a brilliant, big, beautiful game that runs surprisingly well on lower end hardware, but if you wanna get the absolute most out of it, then NVIDIA's cutting edge 40 series GPUs are your ticket to higher frame rates, better image quality, and increased response times. So how do the 40 series GPUs accomplish all that? Well, firstly, there's the raw processing power. NVIDIA hardware is the hands down best on the market. That's just a fact. If we're talking about frame rates and throughput, Nvidia's hardware is always delivering best in class results, no matter what you stack it up against. But here's the thing, that's not all Nvidia GPUs offer. In addition to their raw power, Nvidia also offer a suite of advanced technologies that you can't get anywhere else, and that deliver performance well beyond what that hardware alone could achieve. One of the biggest game changers is NVIDIA's Deep Learning Super Sampling, or DLSS. This is a really sophisticated technology that not only upscales your image, giving you better resolutions at lower cost, but their all new DLSS 3 takes this even further. It actually uses AI to interlace additional frames into the image, giving you even more frames per second than ever before. So in the finals, for example, you can see that with DLSS 3 turned off, I'm averaging around 100 frames per second, which is still great, but when I turn DLSS 3 on, I more than double my frame rate immediately, comfortably sitting at over 200 frames per second in a game as fast and graphically demanding as the finals. In addition to this, DLSS 3 also utilizes something called NVIDIA Reflex, which is another proprietary NVIDIA technology that significantly reduces input latency. If you're playing competitive shooters like the finals, NVIDIA Reflex makes things feel more snappy and responsive, giving you a competitive edge. There's so much more that NVIDIA GPUs are capable of, from full ray tracing in games like Cyberpunk to DLSS 3.5, providing better image upscaling in games like Alan Wake 2, to support for 120Hz TVs if you play PC games on your couch. NVIDIA are the market leaders in this space for a reason. Their hardware and its supporting technology are simply the best. And if you want to get the most out of your games, then NVIDIA GPUs are going to be the way to do it. To learn more, click the link in the description below. Thanks NVIDIA for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.